Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. This is the lesson on pollution and environmental health. All right, when it comes to environmental health, we got to talk about disease and toxicity. So disease, not only caused by microorganisms, oftentimes in a biology course, you're going to talk about bacteria, viruses, uh, other microorganisms, protists, etc., cetera, um, fungus. But it's not just that. Uh, disease can be caused by toxins. It can be chemicals in the air and the water and the food supply that can make people sick in certain doses. Um, other times it could be just gas exposure that can make someone sick. Um, it's not always one, uh, one cause equals one effect. Uh, for instance, with a disease like diabetes, uh, there's a few forms of diabetes. You could get diabetes because of a virus negatively impacting the pancreas and preventing it from releasing insulin as it should. Um, you can also get diabetes by overexposure to sugar over many years uh, to the point where you can develop uh, adult onset diabetes or type 2 diabetes. So um, it's not just uh, one cause, one effect. Uh, sometimes disease uh, has nothing directly to do with uh, microorganisms or pathogens, and it has nothing to do with human activity. Sometimes it just hits without warning uh, and, and is completely non-discriminatory in terms of who it affects. And, and an example of that is a tragedy that happened in Lake Nyos in Africa. Um, the tragedy at Lake Nyos was such that uh, because of natural occurrences in the earth, a lot of CO2 built up at the bottom of a lake and uh, it happened to sit low in the water. But because of a disturbance, um, some geologic activity, maybe earthquakes and such, that gas was pushed upward, got out of the water and drifted down the mountainside into the neighboring town. And because that particular gas happens to be heavier than the rest of the air combined, it was uh, just sitting in the town and it killed over 1,800 people due to asphyxiation. Um, and that's a tragedy, of course. That's just, uh, it didn't discriminate, it just killed a lot of people. Uh, and so there's been a, a attempts to, to solve that problem. What if this buildup happens again and several decades later, the town is harmed once again? So there have been pipes that have gradually been installed in the lake to try to draw out the CO2 and release it into an area where it's not going to be as harmful. Um, the amount of work that's been done so far uh, hasn't done that much to solve the problem completely, so it's, it's a work in progress, and hopefully that tragedy won't happen again. Pollution is an unwanted change in the environment caused by harmful materials or conditions being introduced. And oftentimes we're talking about a man-made cause or human-made cause. Uh, contamination is like pollution, but with contamination we're talking about that specific pollutant or contaminant being in a particular uh, solution or air supply. Um, if we're talking about, oh, our water is contaminated, we're saying it is polluted with a particular substance. A synergism, synergism sorry, is the case where you have multiple pollutants or contaminants together whose effect is greater than the actual sum of their parts. Uh, for instance, you could have um, coal dust and this particular compound individually cause problems with the lungs. But when these two combine, when you get uh, SO2 combining with coal dust, it actually can end up deeper in the lungs. The dust allows it to travel deeper and the combined effect can be much worse than those two independently. So synergism can happen when you get different toxins uh, or pollutants combining. Uh, measuring them. Uh, there's particular ways to measure them. You could say parts per million, that's in PPMs, meaning if we had a million molecules and there's one PPM, that means one of the molecules out of a million is that particular compound. Or it could be even PPB, uh, parts per billion. And by the way, parts per million is actually like saying one milligram per kilogram of material. It's it's the mathematical equivalent. Uh, you could also do it with, hey, uh, milligrams per liter. Maybe we're talking about a certain compound dissolved in water. Uh, whatever it might be, there's various ways for measuring how much of a pollutant is found in a material. A toxin. Uh, a toxin is really... Um, any harmful substance that ends up in the in the environment that can harm a human, 
animal, plant, um, really any organism. So toxicology is the study of those toxins in the environment and the effects they have on animals, plants, etc. A carcinogen is a toxin that specifically is known to cause cancer. So something about that particular toxin um, has the potential to change genes that actually regulate the cell cycle in organisms and lead to having tumors develop, uh, benign or malignant tumors. Uh, malignant being the more harmful, of course. Um, carcinogens, I've read that in cigarette smoke, there's actually over 100 separate carcinogens, which is a scary concept. Uh, when it comes to release of a toxin in the environment, you can have point sources, meaning it's a specific source that has one particular point. So a point source could be uh, a smokestack. From a smokestack at a factory, uh, there could be a lot of different toxins being released. Uh, maybe it's an oil spill. That's a specific area a point that originated. Uh, Non-point sources, also called area sources. Uh, an example of this is urban runoff. So yeah, it does have a particular origin, but it tends to be more widespread with how it's diffused about. So a, a little bit more widespread than something known as a point source. Uh, mobile sources, they move. Uh, a great example of a mobile source is auto or car exhaust. Cars move around. That's what they're designed to do. So that's a mobile source in terms of something being released in the air that could be harmful. All right. And, you know, there's also disease, of course, caused by microbes, not just pollutants and toxins. Microbes include protists. Uh, these are technically eukaryotic cells like ours, but Oftentimes, they're just one cell on its own. They can be multicellular, but generally the protists that cause problems uh, in humans are microscopic, made of just uh, several cells or maybe a few hundred at the most. Bacteria. Um, bacteria, single-celled beings that are prokaryotic, and bacterial infections plague millions of humans every day. Viruses, of course, viruses, those are the, the, the tiniest of those three. They're technically not even made of cells. They're kind of like little, little organic robots, uh, just DNA and RNA or RNA wrapped up in a protein shell. Examples, uh, a, a protist infection, Giardia, that's depicted right here. Giardia causes intestinal problems, and if not treated, uh, it can kill a person. Lyme disease. Uh, Lyme disease is uh, caused by a bacteria that's uh, usually communicated or, or transferred to a person uh, be, uh, by ticks. Um, so if you're, if you're hiking, you have certain uh, parts of your skin exposed, it's possible for a tick, a deer tick perhaps, to land on your skin, bite you, and if it has that bacteria inside of it, it can transmit that into your bloodstream. It can cause um, permanent nerve and muscle damage, and if not treated, it can actually uh, kill a person. Anthrax is also bacterial. Let me actually uh, color code these. Bacteria, bacteria, bacteria. Yeah, actually, um, anthrax is bacillus anthracis. That's the, uh, the common form uh, of bacteria that causes anthrax. Um, a lot of times it comes in like an endospore form, a dehydrated, almost like white powder looking substance. And um, this is something that you hear about in the news. If somebody wants to engage in a terrorist, terrorist activity and send an envelope to somebody to open, when they open the envelope, if they inhale those spores, um, those endospores, as soon as they come in contact with mucous membranes, you can get the bacterial infection. And if untreated, it can kill a person fairly quickly. Uh, salmonella, also bacterial. This is a, a genus of bacteria. It's usually associated with poultry, eating raw chicken or raw eggs. That's not the only place it's found. That's just where the average person is most likely to be introduced to salmonella. Um, there's been salmonella outbreaks where it's been found extensively on, uh, on certain crops and actually ends up uh, on spinach or in other things that have gone to market and there'll be a recall if it's discovered. Uh, with viruses, let's use blue. Um, H1N1. 
Of course, uh, there was a famous uh, worldwide outbreak uh, a few years ago with H1N1, also known as uh, swine flu. The thing with H1N1 is uh, the form that ended up in humans and infecting human to human human ended up av actually having markers for two forms of swine flu, one form of human flu, and an avian flu in it. Um, so really, with increased exposure to livestock in close quarters, these kind of outbreaks could be happening more and more over time uh, if we don't figure out a way to... Uh, reduce that exposure. Uh, HIV, of course, is also viral. Uh, human immunodeficiency virus can lead to AIDS, uh, and it's something that uh, has a virus that actually um, attacks uh, T cells, a kind of white blood cell in the human body. There's also simian uh, immunodeficiency virus, but uh, this is the human form. Anyways, an epidemic is an increased regional spreading of an infectious disease. So there are infectious disease, diseases that are just out there. Um, and we have sort of expected exposures uh, or, or um, an expected kind of rate of contagiousness that, that you know, we've, we've come to live with. But an epidemic is beyond that, where it's uh, an increased spreading that is somewhat of a surprise and actually can lead to a pandemic. Uh, pan, meaning worldwide, uh, that pandemic, uh, an example of that in 2009 with the H1N1, the swine flu, um, SARS, um, uh, bubonic plague, you know, the Black Death in Europe. So with a worldwide outbreak, it, it becomes a pandemic. Uh, so here is actually the cover of a recent issue of uh, the Center for Disease Control um, emerging, emerging Infectious Diseases. So this is something that scientists and doctors uh, should probably keep up on. Toxic heavy metals. These are definitely pollutants that can lead to uh, environmental problems and disease in humans. So with heavy metals, these are the major ones. Mercury, lead, cadmium, nickel, arsenic, selenium, chromium, and there's others. These are found in soil or water, and if they end up in human bodies, they typically end up being stored in fat. Uh, and fat is found all throughout the body. Uh, a lot of it is going to be uh, between the skin and the muscles, that, that subcutaneous layer, also known as the hypodermis. Uh, but of course, fat is found all throughout the body. Um, it's very common for these to be in, in human bodies, in your body and my body. So there's this concept known as the body burden. I have a body burden, you have a body burden. So this is the quantity found in a typical body. With mercury, the average human has about 13 milligrams. This is not enough to kill you. This is actually just a, an expected amount. Uh, mercury is in the water. It's in, it's in the ocean, ends up in fish. Uh, even if you haven't eaten fish before, uh, it's probably in your body. Lead, it's expected that the average person is gonna have about 150 milligrams of lead in their body. Um, the amazing thing is that uh, Lead, there's actually been uh, many attempts in recent decades to reduce the amount of lead used in products that we use, but lead in the history of human civilization is so widespread in terms of its use that it's, it's just, it's in the average human. And arsenic, 18 milligrams found in the average uh, human adult. Um, so if you're, if you're freaking out about this, don't worry. The, these quantities are not enough to cause disease. Uh, you eventually can get to a point where you've, you've exceeded the threshold, meaning, and I'll talk about that more later in the lesson, meaning from that point on, any additional little bit is going to cause some kind of negative effect. Um, for instance, with mercury, though the average person has mercury in, the, in their body, if you were to take this liquid metal mercury right here and roll it around in your hand and play with it a bunch, well, you'd end up getting a lot more seeping into your bloodstream and into your body. And that kind of exposure could negatively affect your brain, uh, potentially make you go crazy. And actually, that stereotype or that uh, classic character known as the Mad Hatter from Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass or Alice in Wonderland, he uh, has come from uh, some anecdotes in history um, uh, about Mad Hatters, that they're actually was a lot of uh, mercury being used to stiffen felt hats uh, in the 1700s, 1800s. And at the time, they didn't realize that was a bad thing, that it was toxic to these people over time. So these people making the hats, their exposure to mercury was way more than the average person. And they had a reputation for being kind of crazy. And so that's how you get the Mad Hatter. It's kind of funny when you find out fiction has its roots in reality.
biomagnification. So biomagnification is a phenomenon that's been studied a lot over the past couple decades. Chemicals from rocks or human processes can increase in concentrations as they move up the food chain. This is also known as bioaccumulation, depending on the textbook you look in. But either way, biomagnification, bioaccumulation, um, this has to do with just moving up trophic levels. When you start with introduction of some kind of chemical, some kind of toxin into the water supply, that's going to inevitably end up in plant life, right? Plants, we all rely on plants. They are the autotrophs, they are the producers. And as something eats the plants, some kind of herbivore eats the plants, some omnivore or carnivore eats them, and so on and so forth, it increases in concentration as it moves up through uh, plants and animals. So some examples, uh, cadmium. If you're wondering, what's so bad about cadmium ending up in my body? Well, there's already a, a little bit of cadmium in your body. However, enough of it has been known to cause uh, heart problems. Uh, specifically, the risk of heart disease goes way up. And if you're wondering, well, how do I get introduced to this thing called cadmium that has 48 protons in this atomic weight and happens to look like this in that jar? Well, uh, cadmium is found in coal dust or coal ash. So, uh, in the United States, there's a lot of coal burning. And that ash is basically a waste of burning coal to create electricity, typically. So usually the coal plants, they'll do something with that ash. They'll bury it. They'll bury it uh, very deep in the earth, but it inevitably ends up in the plant life that results in that soil. So in the plants, it ends up this cadmium, and then you have insects or other herbivores eating the plants. By the time you get up into the carnivores or up into the humans who are eating the animals that have eaten the animals they've eaten those plants, you can sometimes have 50 times the concentration of cadmium in that individual's body than what you initially had placed in the soil in terms of what ended up in each individual plant. So if you think about how the food chain works with, you know, one specific insect, how much plant life they have to eat, and then that animal that eats those insects, how many insects they end up eating, it can, you can easily see how this bioaccumulation thing can happen. With mercury, A, like I said, uh, it's in the water supply. Uh, human activity especially has put mercury into the oceans. Um, it's amazing that even when you look way up in the Arctic Circle where the Inuit people live, Oftentimes, Inuit populations will be 45 minutes to an hour helicopter ride away from where any civilization exists. So if you want to go visit them, it, it's quite a trek, and they're out in the middle of nowhere. But interestingly enough, some of these adult Inuit individuals have 12 times uh, the limit of what uh, the United States considers safe levels of mercury in a human body, because their diet depends a lot on fish, whale seals. And if you consider that a seal is eating a lot of fish and they're getting an accumulation of mercury in their body, once they eat the flesh of a seal, the mercury exposure is, is quite great. Uh, I've also heard um, that in Japan, uh, unfortunately, it's fairly commonplace to uh, hunt dolphin and kill dolphin and even sell them on the market. There are some people in Japan who have eaten dolphin meat without even knowing it because it's sold and it's mislabeled uh, to make a profit off of it. And unfortunately, if you're eating dolphin meat, uh, you're getting a lot of mercury uh, toxicity in your body. Um, just eating tuna is a certain kind of accepted amount of toxicity in terms of mercury exposure. But imagine eating a dolphin. They've eaten hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tuna over their lifetime. Organic compounds, POPs and HAAs, pops and haas. <laughs> All right, so organic compounds, they can be natural or synthetic. Of course, there's the natural ones. There's carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, DNA, RNA, etc. cetera. Uh, but there's also synthetic ones, the ones made in a lab. And scientists have gotten very creative, especially over the last two decades, uh, in terms of making synthetic compounds. There are over 20 million synthetic organic compounds, and up to 100,000 are now used extensively, meaning worldwide, to make all kinds of products, to make drugs, etc. 100,000 of them are used quite a bit. What's a POP? Uh, persistent Organic Pollutant. So it's expected in nature that an organic compound will inevitably 
be broken down. Uh, you know, when, when an organism dies, um, all of their organic compounds eventually are broken down by decomposers and end up in the soil, end up in plants, end up in fungi in the soil, etc. And it's just that cycle of, of uh, energy that we expect. But a persistent organic pollutant does not easily break down. And because of the fact that they just end up in the soil and they end up in the water staying that way and not being part of this gradual cycle of breakdown, a lot of them have been banned or even restricted completely uh, with legal action. So here are some examples. PCBs. PCB stands for, I'll write it out for you, polychlorinated, sorry if it's a little messy, biphenyls. And no, I'm not going to draw them out for you with all those bonds. So polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, they are heat-stable oils that have been put in electric transformers. Uh, you know, electric transformers, there's a lot of heat generated, generated. And so it's an oil that's able to not, you know, light on fire um, and has like an insulatory capacity. So that's an important thing, right? But... Uh, PCBs, unfortunately, if something happens with that transformer, if it explodes, if it has a leak, these PCBs ending up in the soil and ending up in the water supply have been known to cause harmful effects when they end up in the human body. DDT, this has come up before in this lesson, uh, sorry, not this lesson specifically, but in this course, DDT uses a pesticide for many years. Uh, of course, that ending up in humans has caused uh, a lot of problems and in animals. Uh, dioxins. Okay, dioxins is a byproduct of an herbicide. Uh, and, and here's the crazy thing. With dioxin, there was this Times Beach uh, controversy. So in Missouri, the city known as Times Beach had used dioxins in a chemical that was sprayed on roads to uh, control the amount of dust. So there were a lot of complaints, maybe even health problems, over the amount of dust in the air. Uh, people with asthma, etc., going to have some issues. So they're spraying this stuff that had dioxin in it. Well, um, the EPA and other uh, United States organizations came in and they said, you know what, the amount of dioxin exposure that you have caused with this town, the amount of exposure that these people now have, is beyond what we allow. So for $36 million, they bought the town. The federal government bought the town, cleared everyone out. So essentially they paid everybody to leave uh, and paid for the property. They bulldozed everything. They have now made attempts to kind of set up like this nature preserve in that area. And it's gradually coming back in terms of like, you know, the life sprouting up there, but it's no longer a town inhabited by people. Um, it's controversial because with dioxins, here is what the EPA says is the limit in terms of, um, you know, going beyond this limit is going to cause toxicity in the human body. They say 0 0.006 picograms, which is 10 to the negative 12th grams per kilogram per day. That's really tiny. Even when you calculate that somebody could have, you know, 80 kilograms of mass or 90 kilograms of mass, that's still such a tiny amount. And even one of the individuals who had to do with this uh, Times Beach controversy, when, you know, when he actually had a lot to do with making the town leave and, and, and initiating this, he is now even skeptical. Uh, skeptical of, of this particular figure. Um, there are some scientists who suggest that this should even be 10 to 100 times higher. So that's why it's controversial, because different people have different opinions. The EPA has warned that if we go above this limit, you're going to see negative effects in humans. So potentially more studies on lab animals can give us clues about this, but uh, it's a touchy subject because a lot of people's lives were inconvenienced. But at the same time, uh, you don't want to go too easy on these POPs, these persistent organic pollutants, because um, you, know, you don't want people to get sick and or die. Um, Aldrin is another one um, that has ended up in the environment uh, as an insecticide and, and, and caused problems in people in certain doses. An HAA, ha, is a hormonally active agent. So a hormonally active agent, it has an effect on individuals' hormones and, and the regular or expected 
uh, hormone levels in that person's body, whether they're male or female. So an effect on leopard frogs. Let me give you an example there. There is a chemical called atrazine. And it's been uh, used as a weed killer. Well, in Wyoming, in the United States, uh, there was a crazy effect that happened on leopard frogs. Here's a leopard frog, a very common species of frog in uh, North America. And uh, actually, I use leopard frogs oftentimes with dissections in biology. But atrazine, uh, as a weed killer, was being used in Colorado. And because of how water moves from the Rockies down into Wyoming, that's how this chemical ended up downstream in this other state. And uh, the amount of atrazine in the water supply ended up demasculating, oops, demasculating, ended up resulting in the demasculinization, I can't say that, demasculinization, I can't even say that word, of, uh, of male frogs, basically turning male frogs into females, or they also call it the feminization of frogs. So, how does that happen? Well, in a male frog, you have a certain genetic exposure due to sex chromosomes that turns on uh, the gonads in, in order to be testes, in order to make sperm. However, uh, atrazine gets in the way of that hormonal exposure. So the atrazine isn't changing their DNA. It's just getting in the way of the pathway that's supposed to enable the expression uh, and the carrying out of that chemical in order to have this sort of uh, long-term effect in the frog's body. And so you have a lot of male frogs in Wyoming being turned into females. So imagine if naturally you end up having close to 50-50 in terms of the amount of males and females in a population. If all of a sudden a lot of those males are now turning into females because of this interference in their, uh, you know, chemical um, um, triggering in their body, you're going to have a huge reduction in males and not as many offspring. So it can really have a, a negative impact on a population in a short amount of time. So keeping track of how we... Uh, put POPs and HAAs into the environment is a very important thing. Thermal pollution. This is something a lot of people don't think about, but it's heat pollution. Um, this is not talking about global warming. This is talking about um, typically man-made causes uh, in, in one area, um, like by a factory, for instance. Um, thermal pollution can be acute or chronic. So acute meaning uh, short-term. Uh, because of, you know, just a shorter amount of time causing this, this effect, or chronic, this is long-lasting. And it can be natural. You can have um, changes in the environment that could be considered uh, thermal pollution, but I'm going to focus on the human-caused kind. Uh, an example is going to be from electric power plants. So release of heated water into rivers. If you've got this electric power plant that's generating a lot of heat and as sort of their waste, they're letting out this heated water into a nearby river, you might think, oh, what's the big deal? Uh, the animals and the plants, they'll adjust. Not necessarily. When you dump a lot of heated water into a river, you're going to have changes in oxygen concentration. The higher temperature of the water, the less oxygen you're going to have dissolved in there. You're actually going to have a lot more of it escaping as vapor. Um, and it harms plant life. Sometimes uh, algae or other plant life are not used to that huge change in, in heat. Uh, it can also disturb fish. Um, not only uh, adult fish, sometimes they'll, they'll just swim away. They, they will not be able to stick around and that can disturb uh, the food webs in the area. But also, not just the adult fish, also um, the spawning of fish. Uh, having their little, you know, fertilized eggs in that area, uh, they have a certain temperature range that they have evolved to exist in. And if we have this short-term change over the existence of this electric power plant where you have huge increases to the, the degree of temperature in that water, um, you could have the fish population just being damaged um, to the point where it can't be repaired. So solution, how do we uh, deal with this thermal pollution? Cooling towers. Some factories have done the responsible thing and installed a cooling tower where they put the heated water in this area that allows it to be cooled to a 
acceptable, more natural temperature that matches the uh, surrounding environment. And then it's, it's disposed of in the environment. Or artificial lagoons. If you can put the heated water into this man-made lagoon, like a little mini lake, temporarily, let it cool down, and then once it reaches an acceptable temperature, you let the, uh, the gates open and it goes into the river. So those are some solutions for thermal pollution. The pollution solution. Particulates. So these are small particles, also known as dust, released into the atmosphere by natural processes and human activities. So we're going to focus more on the human activity side of it. Uh, they cause problems in certain doses. So you and I may have been exposed to a lot of these particulates, but the dose was so tiny that there are no noticeable effects. Uh, we have not reached past that threshold of what's considered you know, dangerous. An example, the classic example, is asbestos. Asbestos, originally used in the prevention of fire and overheating, as well as, as insulation, so inside of the walls uh, of an apartment building or a house or some other complex. Usually if there's a really old building and they're going to be doing uh, stripping of the walls and tearing down of, of layers, if the uh, person who's heading the project knows, hey, asbestos was used in this building, they will go in with these masks to protect themselves. You do not want to be inhaling asbestos because in certain doses, the inhalation leads to asbestosis, which is basically an infection due to asbestos exposure in the lungs, or mesothelioma, a uh, chronic illness as a result of asbestos exposure. And lung cancer, too. Just a lot of different uh, problems can be caused by this. And actually, there are, I've seen commercials where there are uh, class action lawsuits. If enough people in a workplace were exposed to asbestos without their knowledge, um, and enough of them have mesothelioma, um, these cases have gone to court. Uh, there was a tragedy in Libby, Montana, uh, over asbestos. Um, so workers uh, in a certain area knew that there was asbestos exposure and they were, you know, wearing masks. However, the asbestos getting onto their clothing and onto the things they would take to and from work, every time they would go home, they would gradually expose their families to those particular uh, particulates. And um, a lot of people got sick. A lot of people have gotten these um, chronic illnesses as a result. And it's just this stuff here. This is a microscopic view of what these fibers look like. And enough of them introduced into the lungs cause really severe uh, lung damage. So it's not to be trifled with. Electromagnetic fields, also known as EMFs for short, produced by really anything electronic that you own. Uh, cell phones, electric motors, transmission lines, appliances, computers. And it's controversial as to how dangerous these are. Um, there have been attempts to establish a connection between EMFs, electromagnetic fields, and cancer in children. This is very controversial. So whether it's using this little guy here or this girl using her cell phone, there have been studies confirming that there is a link that children who live closer to power lines, closer to power plants, closer to areas where there's a higher degree of these EMF exposures, that their chances of developing cancer are slightly higher than other children. However, there have been other studies that have confirmed the exact opposite, that they have no greater chance than children living in a rural area where there's a lot less EMFs. Uh, so the jury is still out on this. That's the expression. Um, as time goes on, I think scientists will get better at separating uh, the EMF factor from all the other factors in that person's life. Um, for instance, with the study that confirmed that there was a higher rate of cancer uh, with EMF exposure versus the kids who were far away, there may have been other factors that those children in that neighborhood shared besides the EMF exposure, whether it's something in their diet, uh, hormone exposure, whatever it might be, uh, you know, if it's an HAA. Um, so as time goes on, we'll know more and more. Um, there have been theories that increased cell phone use is likely to cause higher cancer rates in the near future. This is just a theory. This has not been substantiated yet. Uh, and we'll see if, if there are studies that do uh, make a solid connection uh, with the scientific method. Um, I've also heard theories that perhaps increased EMFs in the last few decades have had an effect on bees. 
So I've talked a little bit about uh, the colony collapse disorder uh, in this uh, particular course. Um, I had a conversation with uh, my friend who's also a scientist. Uh, his theory has a lot to do with um, genetic modification of crops having a negative effect on the bees. I think it might, may be a synergistic effect, some kind of combined effect where, where um, changes to crops over time uh, and the bees do rely on plants and, and we've affected them. Uh, combined with EMFs may have these detrimental effects on hives. And we'll see. We need more studies on how EMFs affect us and other organisms. Noise pollution. You don't hear about this a lot. Uh, noise pollution is unwanted sound. That's certainly subjective, right? If it's unwanted, it means that certain people don't want it, or maybe all people don't want it. Sound travels as waves. So this is something you learn about in physics, just a general you know, science concept. Sound travels as waves, not as electromagnetic radiation, uh, as with like visible light or, or x-rays or something like that. No, uh, these are waves that are usually represented by this symbol rather than you know, waves that look like that. So this symbol here, it kind of looks like the volume increasing on an electronic device like your computer, uh, but it's air molecules being brushed up against each other. So uh, the vibrations in terms of how they brush up against each other uh, determines how high pitched or low pitched the noise is, um, the, the uh, amplitude in terms of how loud it is, uh, the force with which they're brushing up against each other, and it's measured in decibels. Okay, so decibels, uh, dBs, is uh, our unit for, for sound. And the scale for this measurement is logarithmic. Here's what that means. If you had a sound that is 10 decibels and then a sound that is 20 decibels, well, the 20 decibel sound is 10 times as strong as that. Makes sense. It's literally 10 decibels louder. But when you get to 30 decibels from here to here, it's actually 100 times louder. Then when you go to 40 decibels, that's a thousand times louder than 10 and so on and so forth. So that's why it's logarithmic. So we're talking about an incredible range. Let me give you some examples. And by the way, if you're wondering what the heck is this, it's, it's a, a decibel meter. It's, it's used to measure sound. All right, zero decibels. That's the threshold. Meaning you may not be able to distinguish a zero decibel sound. That's really what it's pointing at, that below zero, you can't hear any of it, the average human at least. Once we go above zero, oh, I think I just heard something. It was very faint. So when you get finally to like, you know, five or 10, you can actually hear it. 20 decibels is a whisper. Hey, this is, uh, this is about 20 decibels. Can you hear me? 45. I'm going to use the ditto mark for decibels. That's the uh, average home. So if you are sitting in your home or apartment by yourself, not making any noise, there's still noises around you. Um, like when I sit perfectly still in here and don't allow my chair to creak, I can actually hear the computer off to my right. I, I can hear it humming. Uh, it's very, very faint, um, but there's noises that happen, whether it's your refrigerator, uh, your dishwasher, uh, the hum of however you get AC into your place. Um, the average home has a sound. 65, normal conversation. A norm convo, kind of my, I, I actually talk a little bit louder than the average person, but right about here, this is, this is a normal conversation. This is about 65 decibels. Uh, 110 decibels. Rock and roll, rock concert. Uh, so yeah, when I saw Pearl Jam last year, um, it was pretty loud and uh, I enjoyed myself, but I probably should have brought earplugs. I've actually uh, read accounts by uh, Pete Townsend, the guitarist from The Who, classic rock band. Uh, he has permanent hearing loss because of so much guitar playing over his many years, you know, his, uh, just about 50 years of being a famous rock musician. Uh, yeah. He now warns the youth like, hey, you guys are even listening louder, louder and louder to your, you know, personal uh, music than I did when I was a child. And, you know, people who go to a lot of concerts or play a lot of music, they're at risk for uh, permanent hearing damage. Um, so wearing 
those earplugs actually might be something that's wise to do. You can still hear the music. It's just a little muffled. And then, of course, once you get above about 160, you're talking very immediate hearing damage. Uh, rocket launch. Rocket launch at 180. So, uh, and, and if a plane takes off, we're talking, you know, 165, 170. Uh, you need those huge industrial, like, oh, I can't hear what you're saying kind of headphones because, uh, yeah, that's a massive, massive sound wave going into your ear hole. Oh, besides noise pollution, there are other forms. Uh, light pollution. That's something a lot of people don't think about, but I live in Los Angeles. There's quite a bit of light pollution to the point where I can't see the stars very well. So going camping, you know, a couple hours out of LA, very nice for seeing the stars in the Milky Way. Um, light pollution has also affected organisms like uh, sea turtle. Uh, when sea turtles hatch, they naturally instinctively want to go towards the water and they kind of will see like the moonlight reflecting off the water and go that way. But unfortunately, some sea turtles have been attracted to lights of the city that are away from the water. And some people might think, oh, well, those are stupid sea turtles. No, uh, that's a human activity that has negatively impacted that species. It's something you don't think about that often. All right, pollutant exposure and assessing risk. Dose, response, and dose response. So a dose is the amount that an individual is given, right? If you're on a medication, you take a certain dose, certain number of times a day, certain times per week, etc. The response is the effect on the body. Now, dose response is those two things uh, together in terms of how a human is affected by this particular pollutant or this drug. So whether we're talking about a pollutant or drug, I'm actually going to use uh, certain drugs or certain uh, chemicals you don't consider pollutants as an example in this particular slide. Uh, but when you're talking about this stuff, you're going to see LD, ED, and TD50 uh, depictions in terms of uh, kind of a linear graph in terms of how people are affected. Uh, so here we go. With LD50, this is lethal dose for 50%. So a population of, of people or animals, uh, a study group, whatever the group is we're talking about, the lethal dose means 50% of the population dies at this level. So with LD50, um, you're not going to see a lot of those scenarios when you're, when you're testing a drug or pollutant uh, on people. We don't want 50% of people to die. That's inhumane. That's terrible. But you'll see LD50 if they're testing a certain drug in the initial trials on lab rats. And I know uh, whatever lab animals use, I know a lot of people out there uh, are opposed to that. Um, but some of the benefits of using those animals is, is undeniable. So um, unfortunately, yeah, there are cases where in the initial trials, 50% hey, of them died. We want to shoot for a dose that is lower than that, obviously, if that dose killed half the population. ED50, this is the effective dose For 50%, meaning at this level, at this dose, 50% of the group, there is an effect that is noticeable, that's tangible. You can see it. Um, let's say we're doing a study on aspirin. Uh, whatever dose cures the headache in 50% of the people, that's the ED50. And then TD50, this is toxic dose and 50%. So not enough to kill the individual, but it's a toxic level. Uh, so you're getting past a threshold where now there are these negative health effects. So this could be like the, the pollutant or drug has interfered with enzyme activity. Um, you're getting uh, severe negative health effects. The, the individual has not died, but you're talking uh, long-term negative health effects uh, at, at that toxic dose level. All right, threshold, I mentioned this earlier in the lesson. Threshold, uh, we're talking about below that level, there's no noticeable change in the individual, but above that level, above the threshold, you start to see either uh, an effective dose, hey, it's starting to affect them, oh, toxic, and then lethal. If we were to order these in terms of like, hey, here's the one, then the other, then the next, First, you're going to see the effective dose, hopefully. Like, oh, we're starting to see 
an effect on this individual. Then you get to the point where it's TD50. Oh, now it's, now it's toxic. Now there's these negative health effects because we've exposed them too much. And then after that, is typically going to be lethal, where at that level, then 50% of them are dying. An ecological gradient is an interesting application in environmental science with pollutant exposure. If you have pollutant exposure from, let's say, a point source, certain factory, uh, smokestacks, whatever, the ecological gradient is when you see how life is affected moving away from the factory. Oftentimes, if there's a lot of that pollutant nearby the factory, which makes sense because it's close to the point source, you're going to see a lot less trees. Maybe there's only uh, certain weeds growing there and, and certain plants that have um, tolerance to like toxicity levels and, and they grow quickly, whatever it might be. And as you move farther and farther away, you're able to see a wider variety of plants because they're farther away from that pollutant and there's less exposure. So that's an ecological gradient. And you could also see the same in human populations in terms of how close they are to a pollutant. Um, there certainly was an ecological gradient with the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Um, and you're going to see more about nuclear power in a future lesson in this course. Uh, tolerance. There are different forms of tolerance. You can have physiological tolerance. Uh, an example is ozone, O3. So oxygen gas is O2. That's normal and, and useful for us to inhale that. We need that as a, aerobic organisms. But O3, you normally wouldn't be exposed to a lot of that. O3, ozone, is found way up in the atmosphere. But there was a study done that exposed people to increasing levels of O3. They were inhaling it. And at first, these individuals, the vast majority of them, had respiratory distress. It was... <sighs> It would, there were some negative uh, effects, but as the study went on, their bodies adjusted. Their bodies developed a physiological tolerance where they were able to deal with it, and after a while, they didn't even notice that they were exposed to it. Another one is genetic tolerance. And I've talked about this numerous times. Uh, DDT. Um, you know, DDT has been used as a pesticide in numerous cases, and we've learned from our mistakes. All it takes is one individual that has a gene that allows resistance to that DDT. If they can pass on that gene to its offspring, it can spread through the entire population. And then you have genetic tolerance or resistance uh, against a certain chemical or pollutant. All right, risk assessment. Anytime people are exposed to pollutants in the environment, uh, whatever the source is, whatever the pollutant is or the toxin, identification of the hazard, meaning like, hey, do we really know what's causing this negative health effect? Is it the pollutant ex itself? Uh, what do these people have in common? Uh, are, are they all going to the same source? What is it? Dose response assessment, meaning figuring out this stuff, okay? How much of it uh, is in the environment and at what level are we? Are we at the point where only half of the people are getting sick? Uh, is it at the toxic level? Is it just at the effective level where we're just starting to see some negative things happening in the body, but we're not quite at toxicity? Exposure assessment. Hey, how many people have been exposed? It may not just be that community. Um, it may be people who have temporarily visited there. Uh, is this a tourist area? So there are a lot of things to consider with like how many people have been exposed. And then risk characterization. When you've done these three, it leads you to making broad decisions about how to deal with this particular uh, pollutant exposure. And it's controversial because there's not just one way to go about doing this. Uh, different organizations have different opinions of how harmful pollutants are um, and, and what particular doses uh, are acceptable, um, whether it's dioxin, like I mentioned earlier, or um, just vast amounts of POPs and pollutants um, that are found in the environment. So these are very important things to consider. Okay, so a fluoride example. We were just talking about uh, different dose response curves, LD50, ED50, TD50, those things. Let's look at an example. Now, typically fluoride is not considered a pollutant, um, but depending on who you ask on this planet, uh, you're gonna get different responses. In the United States, for example, uh, fluoride is actually in our water supply. It's in the tap water. We've grown accustomed to it. Uh, but in a lot of European countries, they don't do that. 
uh, they don't think it's wise. Um, some people would argue that we have enough fluoride in toothpaste products, that when we go to the dentist and get a fluoride treatment, that's enough. Let me give an example of how too much fluoride could be a bad thing. Okay, this is going to be kind of an atypical looking graph. Uh, here's your, your x-axis. Um, up here is going to be beneficial. Bene. <laughs> and down here is going to be harmful. Okay, like a negative in a sense. And this is going to be with increased dosage. So here's dose levels, dosage. Uh, let's use black. Okay, so with fluoride, it could look like this. Okay, so right in here is a region that we could consider optimum. That's the optimum dosage for your health, okay? Because you can see we've, we've reached the peak in terms of benefit on the y-axis. So here is like optimal dose for bone and dental health or teeth health. Teeth health sounds silly, but dental health. Um, so you'd say, hey, if there's that in the water supply, great. Uh, but if that's in your water supply and you're using a lot of toothpaste and you're getting fluoride treatments every time from the dentist and maybe you're exposed to some other uh, set of chemicals that has a lot of fluoride in it, well, uh, your dosage could become so much where maybe at this point you get abnormal bone formation. It has been observed in certain people that if they're exposed to too much fluoride, they're actually going to grow, grow too much bone in certain parts of their body. Uh, and maybe you get to the point where like, hey, when you're down in this section, maybe death? I mean, who knows in terms of toxicity levels? Um, so with something like fluoride, uh, there's still a bit of controversy in terms of uh, how much is too much, how much is too little. Um, but whether it's fluoride, whether it's DDT, whether it's uh, dioxin, um, you can see these, these curves in terms of um, you know, levels where it's like too little, levels where it's just right, and levels where it's too much. Um, so we can figure out how harmful and how beneficial uh, these doses are to people. Thanks for watching Educator.com.